All right, greetings everybody. We are getting ready to do our book club. We, we got the fascinating books. I will link it below for you guys to order. This is the stuff our parents never did teach us. We're gonna learn together. We're gonna learn the correct way about things, about the divine feminine, divine masculine, and what happens when you're out there all about men spreading their seeds all around and women absorbing their seeds all around, all right? The infamous book, Sperm Wars, all right? This one is going to, now I already marked the pages from yesterday where we were gonna start off at because I opened it up and that's what I read when I first opened to see what spirit want me to read. So we got all three. If you guys have not got these by Robin Baker, please get them. I will link it, the Amazon link below for y'all. This is for the book club, 1010 Portal. Let's get educated together. All right, now we did, I did open up to, this one must have been the first page. So we're gonna start, I think here, uh, one of them was, yeah, the licking infidelity. That was last actually, but this one was the first one. This is, yeah, this is what I first opened it up to, but it was on the chapter scene of correcting mistakes. So I'm gonna start, I was looking at this page, so I'm gonna start right here where that little squiggly line is. At a glance, the couple in this scene have behaved very strangely. Why did they both feel like intercourse again so soon? Why did the woman now feel like intercourse and not foreplay? Why did she feel like an old orgasm during intercourse now when only half an hour earlier she had felt no such inclination? Should each person's behavior really have been part of a strategy that over enough occasions would enhance their reproductive success? As we know, a woman does not need to climax during intercourse or sperm to enter her cervix, even without a climax. Go in the room. Uh, the inseminated collects at the top of her vagina to form a pool. Her cervix hangs into the pool and sperm leads to escape into her cervix mucus. Scene three. This is deep. <laughs> Nevertheless, a go in the room. Good night. Go. Kari, put that put that remote back on that table. You can't take that in the room. Go. Go. Till they get out of here. Uh, none, nevertheless, a climax does not does does make a difference to how many sperm enter her cervix. Usually, a climax during intercourse weakens her cervix filter greatly, allowing many more sperm to leave the seminal pool, Ooh. penetrate the cervix mucosa, and hence be retained. Such a climax, therefore means fewer sperm are ejaculated into the flow back. The multiple orgasm in which a woman has two or even more climaxes without coming down in between has an even greater effect on sperm retention. Essentially, this influence of the orgasm, whether single or multiple, is achieved in four ways. Whew. This is deep. <laughs> First, when a woman climaxes during intercourse, her cervix 
gapes in just the same way as it does during masturbation, scene 22. As we saw then, this gape, gapping stretches the cervical cervical mucosa sideways, widening exist, existing mucus channels and creating new ones by splitting the mucus and thereby opening up many more pathways for many more sperm. Any blocked channels in her cervix are effectively bypassed and rendered ineffective. Secondly, as she climaxed during intercourse, her cervix dips up and down as well as gapes again just as it does during masturbation now however it is dipping up and down in seminal flu fluid thereby mixing the pool this mixing helps more sperm particularly older less mobile ones to contact the pen to contact and penetrate the cervix mucosa mucus thirdly the climactic contraction and rippling of muscles in the womb and vagina during orgasm to generate pressure changes in the womb and cervix. These changes effectively suck the usual fingers of semen. Scene three, much further into the channel of the cervical mucus. The stronger the upsuck of semen into channels that are already increased in number and enlarged by the orgasm does two things. It helps to neutralize any acidic, any acidic, 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 acidic I can't get the word out. Acidity, acidity, acidity of the lower part of the mucus glacier, making it easier for sperm to escape the seminal pool into the cervix, and it increases the volume of semen to in contact with the mucus again, allowing more, many more sperm to escape. Fourthly, a woman's climax during intercourse voids many of her cerv cervical crypts of old sperm, although these ejaculated ejected sperm may eventually block some of the newly formed channels in the same way as they do after the masturbatory orgasm. Sperm may newly arrive from the seminal pool, still find that they have many more cryptics all to themselves. Crypts. Effectively, these four, these Effectively, therefore, an intercourse orgasm creates more storage space for cervix to occupy. I mean, for sperm to occupy. Wow, this is a... Uh... Okay. I'm going to start right there. Let me get this other one. Oh, just the uh, licking infidelity scene 10. And uh, this is where the sticker is, so I'm going to read right here. Because humans are not, of course, the only animals to indulge in oral sex. Most male mammals, from rats to dogs, rats and dogs to elephants and monkeys, muggle smell and lick the female's vulva during foreplay. Monkeys also touch a female's genitals sometimes, inserting their fingers into her. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute.
Wait a minute. <laughs> Woo! Ooh wee, y'all. This is deep. Uh. The monkeys also touch the females in turn and certain their fingers in there. Then smell And they eat them. Born with What all these males are doing is collecting information. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to make it through this book. Because <laughs> my mind is like... <laughs> they are seeking the answers to three questions. Is the female healthy? Remember, I told y'all about that, right? Is she fertile? And has she recently had sex with another male? Told y'all. So they already know half of y'all already. A man is doing exactly the same and the information he collects can be a big help in his pursuit of reproductive success. If a woman's secretion smell or taste particularly unpleasant, the, man, the male may lose interest in penetrating altogether. The, the smell may indicate disease. It says such information is most useful when a man is contemplating sex with a new woman, with a new woman. And because disease can't, can come and go. It is also worth a man testing the health of even a long-term partner secretions from time to time. Mm -hmm. Many In many mammals, the smell of the female secretion is clearly different and more pleasant in males during her first, her, during her fertile phase. In women though, and is other mammals which widely their fertile, which hide their fertile phase, the cha the change in smell during the cycle is much less apparent. In some experiment in the USA, a group of volunteer women each wore a tampon overnight on different days of their menstrual cycle. The tampon were placed in open tubes so they could see, so they could be smelt and not, but not seen them given to the panel of assessors. The smell of the tampon was ranked on a scale from very unpleasant to very pleasant. Pleasantness of smell changed with stage of the menstrual cycle. Being most unpleasant during menstruation, on average the smell was slightly, but not consistently, more pleasant during the fertile phase. Pineapple juice can only do so much. N muzzling a woman's vulva, a man can at least tell if she is menstrual. As long as the woman's secretion pass a man's health and fertile test, the main piece of information he is seeking is whether she has recently, recently had sex with another man. The man's body can then use this information to change the number of killers and egg getters he produced into hers. As he have already seen, crude adjustments are made on the basis of what proportion of time he has spent with the woman over the past week or since their last intercourse, scene six. The last time he has spent time, has spent with her, the greater the possibility that she might 
contain sperm from another man and the more sperm he introduces. This method works, but it is crude. If his body could know whether sperm from another man are present, he could make a much finer adjustment to his own sperm number. Oh, oh my God. Talk about sperm wars. Mm -mm -mm. In scene 10, the man came home to a partner who at some time during the day had clearly been unfaithful to him. She had covered her tracks as best she could by changing the bed, washing the sheets, and preventing him from seeing her back in case he noticed the small marks left on, left by her lover. Most important of all, how, now how did I happen to open up this last night doing pop-up to this particular page that I have been talking to y'all about cheating, about multiple men and things like that. And then it happens to be on the exact page that I just flip open. That's divine timing. That proves to y'all exactly what I've been saying. Women are just as guilty as men. And I'm not saying all men are guilty and I'm not saying all women are guilty, but that proves the point that all women are not innocent. That's what that's proven. Okay. So, uh, in most cases of all, however, she has also had a long bath to try to remove all traces of her lover from her pubic hair, thighs, and vulva lips. In all of this, she was obeying her conscious mind, albeit driven by a body that wanted neither to be beaten nor des deserted. Her body had ejected her lover's flow back many hours ago, but some traces of semen always remain in the vagina, sometimes up to a day. At first, she had tried to avoid sexual contact with her partner completely. I got a headache. Oh, I'm cramping. That's them stories y'all be telling. Her body, some of y'all. Her body, sometimes we do have a headache, especially when we do everything in the house with the babies and stuff. Her body, actually, literally don't even be turned on, actually. But some women will do that, use that number to, because they've been playing around, like he just said. Her body favored the lover and wanted to give his sperm as easy a victory as possible. Whoa, hold up, hold up, hold the hell up. So, oh my God, so she don't have sex with her husband because she wants to get pregnant by the lover and then frame the man that she's with that this his baby but it's actually the baby of the mm. Mm. i need to keep i need to keep scoring this book right now women you're losing you're losing you're losing you're losing Wow. So to give her to give the lover a better chance for his sperm to take root, you you complain you don't have sex with yours because it'll wash out. Then you know what I'm saying? It'll override what's already been deposited. Given the the husband more likely is his baby versus his versus if you just don't have sex with the husband, then you you have a better chance of it being the, the baby's lover. Could, is that and could that be Y'all tap down below what y'all think. Could that be because she has uh, talked about leaving him, the husband? Or could it be because she want to hide the fact, want the baby, but want to hide the fact who the father is? Or could it be that there's an indication she don't plan on being with the original husband much longer and then she would have the baby that belonged to that man? Now, the question here is, is that man available? Or is that man, does that man have a wife? 
that's the question. Let's see if he get to this. Oh, I said I had this book two years last night and it was really one because it said 22 and I thought it was 24 and that was on my mind this morning. So I got to stand corrected. I was like, why did I, why did I calculate that wrong? I was like, that ain't two years, that's one. So I stand corrected. I've had these books a year. So I've not read these books. I read like skim some, but not like marked in them or anything. Just read like the back and a couple, but not really divulged in these books. But I'm going to get in them now. <laughs> okay, as you can see. Because of all this dating talk and relationships. And make sure y'all go to my website and get my You're Not It Sis book. It's a dating book. All right. Uh, so you guys can, you know, get some information, some uh, things y'all can uh, learn when you're dating out there. And take your time and slow down. And this is why. This is not all why, but this is some of, some of why. Especially you men. Now you see. Stop rushing into with these women because they could definitely be pulling a whammy on y'all if y'all decide, dude, and they have a husband. And now they're trying to have a baby by y'all. So y'all, like I said, practice semen retention and learn to not go there and hold off because you never know. Because these women be lying just like y'all, just like men be lying, the women be lying. Okay. At the same time, though, she did not want to lose her partner's support. See, because that, you can think about it like this. Sometimes, even though they, they have a lover, the husband could make more money. And they don't want to lose that support, but they want to have that baby with the other guy. The guy, the guy probably don't make as much as the husband, or the lifestyle isn't as much as the, as good as with the, uh, the person that they're with. Boy, this is very deceptive. Uh, he... Consequently, when he began to muzzle her vagina and the risk of her infidelity being discovered increased, she changed her strategy. She switched from avoiding intercourse to precipitating it solely to distract him from oral, oral sex. On the other side of town, the woman had returned home to a suspicious partner. She had the advantage. However, that her vagina contained no evidence of how close she had come to infidelity. As a result, she had the opportunity to both reassure, to reason, to reassure, I'm sorry, and mislead her partner, not only verbally by criticizing the man she had been with, but by forcing him to smell and lick her vagina so as to confirm her innocence. By the end of the evening, both his mind and his body should have been reassured. Together, the two scenes of oral sex we have just witnessed illustrate the interplay of reassurance and fur sub subterfuge that is a hallmark of routine, routine sex between couples. Men may not be able to lick their partner's infidelity or by oral, oral sex, but they can certainly collect information useful for deciding what to do next. In the short term, the information can help men to prepare for sperm warfare. In the medium term, it can help them to adjust the intensity of Intensi intensity with which they guard their mate or search for another partner. In the long term, it can help them be to assess the desirability of desertion and if their partners produce a child to judge the probability of the child having been fathered by someone else. Ooh. Hey, y'all. Oh, y'all. Y'all done. <laughs> Boy, y'all done. Y'all done on this one. Now, this this man, he, he, this book kick ass. At the same time, through a strategic prevention of encouragement of oral sex, a woman can attempt to reassure or dupe her partner with regard to the actual situation. Of course, people do not always realize that 
they are indulging in oral sex for the above reasons conscientiously what a man thinks he is doing when he licks a woman's genitalia is stimulating her into becoming lubricated for penetration most often in the absence of infidelity what a woman thinks is she's doing is seeking sensual sexual stimulation <laughs> both of these are happening of course but they are merely the conscious veneer of the behavior not its ultimate function as in so much of sexual behavior the mind consciously pursues the superficial simulation at the be behest of the body aiming to achieve much more potent ends. Checkmate. Look at him. He's talking about checkmate. I need to read all the way over here, but I want to get to the other two books. Mm. My leg hurt. I had to get off that chair down there. I guess I, made a, I might as well read this. I was trying to skim it to see if it was uh, there is no intrinsic reason by licking a woman's genitals should stimulate her sexually any more than stamping on her foot. Nevertheless, one action is a sexual stimulus, the other is not. What tends to happen in the evolution of sexual stimulation is that unequivocal signs of sexual interest becoming stimulating while other signs do not. If this were not the case, males and females would be continually responding sexually to the most irrelevant signals. For the reason, for the reason we have already discussed, male ancestors were driven by their bodies to seek valuable information contained in and around a female's vagina, the inevitable site of insemination. Failure to seek this information before intercourse costs the male in four ways. Mm. Mm. Okay. Wow, and I was getting ready to read that. That was 30 minutes, y'all. Let me do another 15, maybe, hopefully. Let me do another 30. Maybe I can get to these other two books. That'll be an hour. 2911 up there. So in the four ways, it is meant a it meant a greater risk of disease, more chance of inseminating an infertile female. Remember I talked about it in barren female? It said less chance of winning sperm wars over the other male. Remember they, they go into war battle the uh the to see what male is dominant, so it's gonna wage a war inside that woman. That's what I was talking about. That's what I was telling y'all about. That's interesting. Spirit brought me right exactly to the page when I put these markers in from last night, and I didn't even pick it up until just now. I didn't even want to read it without reading it with y'all first, and that's that's amazing that that is right there. So that's that was that was proof. 
That was the truth. And a reduced chance of combating infidelity. From the female's perspective, these pressures on the male meant that when a male muzzled her vulva in, in it equivocally signaled his sexual interest. If she was uninterested, she could simply walk away. Mm. If interested, she needed to prepare for intercourse by lubricating her vagina and so forth. Such uh, advanced preparation would make the process of insemination itself more effective, more efficient and less damaging. All in all, females who respond to being muzzled by an attractive male by becoming aroused will have reproduced more successfully than those who did not. The same argument applied to the male. If female ancestors allowed him to muzzle her vagina instead of walking away, this indicated that they were interested in receiving his sperm. Males who responded by becoming aroused will have missed fewer opportunities for intercourse than males who did not. All in all, males who gain sexual stimulation from muzzling the vulva of a female will have reproduced more than those who did not. All of these responses were shaped long before there were humans. When our species first evolved, the male simply inherited from our primate ancestors a predisposition for muzzling, smelling, licking, and fingering the female genitals. Ooh, y'all. Also, we also, male and female alike, inherited a predisposition to find such behavior stimulating. Oh Lord. Okay. That's that was that one. Let me get to this page I marked yesterday, which was happened to be the first chapter, which was really I never even opened up to the first chapter. Generation game, scene one, great uncle who? Okay. I'm, I'm gonna read just a little. Oh, that's a little thing right there, so I can stop right there and maybe get to the end get to the book. We're reading three of his books all at once. This one is The Sperm Wars, The Evolution of Logic of Love and Lust. Okay. This, it says the book that explains how genetic programming, not our psyches, drives our most destructive sexual behaviors. Same, the same uh, author. The fa Okay, this is scene one, Uncle great uncle who with a question mark the face of the increased brown photo stared impressively at the woman their gazes spawning the hundred years between them and her and her she loved this photograph and often asked if and often asked to see it when she visited her grandmother the face belonged to three young children all long dead frozen in time by some ancient camera at the moment early in their lives. They, they were standing in a line, tallest and oldest on the left, shortest and youngest on the right. The two boys at either end were aged about 10 and two, the girl in the middle about five. Whenever the young woman looked at the their faces, she sensed a continuity with the past that she never experienced at any other time. The photograph showed her great-grandmother with her two brothers, but the very little st stretching of the imagination, it could be her looking out from the photograph. The resemblance between her and her great-grandmother as a child, as children, were uncanny. was uncanny. Her grandmother called it the family face. <laughs> So many of their clan having the same bone structure and eyes. The generation. That's the, what's that called? The generation game. The woman looked at the photograph a little longer, then asked her grandmother to tell her the story of their family just one more time before 
speaking, the old woman fumbled to the front of the album and took out a large sheet of paper. This family tree was their pride and joy, and she loved showing it and the photographs to her many grandchildren. The young woman concentrated hard as her grandmother spoke, determined this time to remember what was said. She knew that once one of the boys in a photograph had not lived long enough to have children. Her great-grandmother, however, had not only survived, but but had also escaped the poverty of her family background. She had been a pretty child who had grown into a beautiful young woman, chased by all of the young men in the village. While working as a servant in a large household, she became pregnant by the owner's son. <laughs> the baby was her grandmother, the teller of the story. Instead of being disowned and sent away, her great-grandmother was welcomed into the family. Everything happened so quickly that despite gossip, nobody ever knew for sure that the baby had been conceived illegitimately. The young couple lived together in a relative comfort, in a relative comfort for the rest of their lives and produced four more children. All were boys and unusually for their generation and unusual for their generation all had survived. The grandmother then pointed to the oldest boy in the photograph, her uncle. He had not been as lucky as his sister and had failed to escape the poverty into which he had been born. Like his sister, he also had five children. Three had died as babies and one of the survivors, a boy, had been killed in World War I when only 18 when only 18 year, 18 year old, the, the other survivor, a girl, was infertile and died alone in her 50s. A few years after her partner, the youngest boy, the one with the bright eyes and smile, had died of measles about two years after the, photo after the photograph was taken. Dang. The young woman poured over the family tree with her grandmother. The tree had the shape of a pyramid, three names at the top, and three children, young children in the photograph, and about 50 at the bottom of the woman's own generation. Then suddenly she noticed something that had never occurred to her before. Every single one of the 50 people in her generation traced back to her great-grandmother, the pretty girl in, in the picture, not one, of course, traced back to either of those two boys. Mm, dang. The 50 women went back. I mean, the one, the 50. The young women bent forward to look. Oh, the young woman bent forward to look at the family tree more closely, she was looking for others who, like the two boys, had no living descendants and those lines of the tree, on those lines of whose, let me, had, had no living descendants and whose lines on the tree therefore ended in mid midair. Dang. The most conspicuous was one of her grandmother's brothers, the great uncle whose name she could never remember, but who was reputed to have had a very strangely shaped nose. She spotted two more lines in ending in midair before her stance became too uncomfortable. Unable to bend forward any longer, she straightened up and turned away from the paper and photographs. As she did so, the baby in her womb kicked. She winced then smiled and held her stomach. At least her line wasn't going to end in midair. Ooh. That was at 3933. Routine sex. Wow. Mm. Okay. Our personal characteristics depend on our genes. 
chemical instructions for how we should develop and function. Those instructions are packed in sperm and egg and passed down our family tree, finally reaching us via our genetic parents. And we inherit more than our family face via these genetics. We also inherit many aspects of our psychology, physiology, and the behavior, including much of our sexual behavior. This book, this book's task is to work out why we behave sexually as we do. The approach is to ask why it is that people with some sexual strategies, patterns of sexual behavior are more successful reproductively than people who, people with other strategies. The measure of success is the number of the descendants mm. because this is what shapes future generations so how many children you can have is considered like the number of success that's why they probably had babies all back when like how nick cannon having a whole two hockey stadiums full of children <laughs> that was pun intended a little, a little joke <laughs> okay Families and populations become dominated by the descendants of their most successful ancestors. They also become dominated by those people characteristics. In the scene we just saw, the young woman's generation was dominated by her great grandmother's face, not by the great uncle whose, whose nose. For all she knew, her generation was also dominated by a family sexuality passed on to so many people by the dynasty founders, her great grandparents. Nobody will have inherited directly the sexuality of the great uncle who, whatever his sexual strategy might have been, it was unsuccessful and he left no descendants to inherit it. Hmm. That meaning he didn't have any children. He, he lived and didn't even have any children for whatever reason. He didn't have any. Uh, it is irrelevant to our generation whether people in the past wanted children or grandchildren or whether it just happened. The only factor to shape our characteristics is who had children and how many and who did not. The great-grandmother and the great-grandfather in the scene, one, were probably most dismayed when their sexual fun produced a child. But if it hadn't, the younger woman and her 50 or so family contemporaries would not have lived. In fact, in, in effect, each generation plays a game in which its members compete to pass their gene on to the next generation. Each generation has its winners, like the pretty girl in the picture, and each has its losers, like her two brothers and great uncle. We are the descendants of the winners, the people who sex, who sexual strategy paid off, meaning we, we got through. <laughs> when you topple that with the book, the, the, the piece that we just read in this book, how the sperm, the man's sperm, try to outdo the other ones. And then with this, you can see how spirit just linked this, these three books up just for me opening the pages and, and boom, boom, and there they are linked. So we were the ones that got through. We, we were the ones, if your mother was, in, 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 you know, having infidelity or whatnot, not to say she was, but if she was, you were the one that got through from the real father or by, versus the, the man that she wasn't with. You were the product of the lover. And we have, we have people like that in our families. The generation gain will continue as long as some people in the generation have more children than others. In our own generation, the gain is as active and cruel as ever. It will still be the genes of those among us who produce the most descendants that will characterize future generations, not the genes of those who produce few or none. Whether we know it or not, whether we want to or not, and whether we care or not, we are, we are all programmed to try to win our generation's game of reproduction.
Yeah, I'm still eating, girl. To pursue the reproductive process. I said, she said, oh, you eat slower than a bitch. You still reading? Because I'm talking. Oh, okay. I got to break this shit down. It says, I got problem solved. Get back in that room. To pursue reproductive, okay, to pursue, pursue reproductive process. Our success ancestors have straddled us inescapably with genetic instructions that tell us not only that we must compete, but also how to compete. Mm. Inevi inevitably, some of us will have had more successful ancestors than others because we are giving birth to our ancestors. That's why we say we are our ancestors returning. All right, if y'all haven't heard that in spirituality, that's where it's, that's why he's saying that we are our ancestors returning. Uh, and that some of us have had more successful ancestors than others, so that even in our generations, there will be some people who have inherited instructions for potentially better strategies. When our, gener when our generation yes. comes to work out it, its final score, some people will have done better than others. Let us investigate why some people are more successful than others in life's generation game. I don't know if I want this one or not. Oh, I don't know if I want this one or not. Let's get the other one because we got 12 minutes. So we got 12 minutes. Uh, hey, that's good, y'all. Then on this one, we got, let's see, the scene 21, the abandoned section. But I think it was really this. Yeah, it was this, but I had to see what scene, what chapter it was. Scene 21, this one is Sperm Wars, The Science of Sex. It's going to take too long to get over here. So I'm going to have to go. Hush, y'all. Why he go back there messing with them babies? Let's go right here. That's where I want to end up at because that's the page right there, 155. But I'm going to be on 151. In, in scene 18 to... In scene 18 to 20, we discuss the problem women face in selecting a mate. But in this scene, the two women seem to give up all attempt at mate choice in favor of walking promiscuity. Oh, this. <laughs> what circumstance could favor such behavior from the point of view of a woman? Reproductive success and what are the repercussions likely to be? Ooh. It says, in most societies, relative few people ever take part in an orgy, perhaps more, no, perhaps no more than 1%. According to a recent survey of nearly 4,000 women, occasionally, however, such behavior in common, the classic example, of course, are historical. For instance, the well-documented orgies of ancient Rome. Anthropology, anthropologically, there are some societies that have ritualized orgies, particularly for adolescents. In addition to those that may have occurred spontaneously, taken as a whole, extremely organic or or orgiastic behavior is relatively uncommon but in less extreme form it is not so unusual it says okay at one extreme is an orgy in which a woman as in scene 21 allows several men to inseminate that's what i was talking about you see how spirit linked all these books y'all with what i was just talking about having multiple partners and prostitute cat and and sleeping with more than one man in a day or in a week, and I'm t and I literally turned to the all the pages 
to verify what I was talking about. That's spirit is a bad mamma jamma. That's all I got to say. Spirit is a bad motherfucker. God damn. Like literally just opened these up last night from pop up and put these markers here to come back and read them whenever I had book club again. But these books were calling and I was like, I got to get these books. Something's telling me to read these pages and I'm glad I did. Let's go back. Okay. At one extreme in an orgy in which a woman, as in scene 21, allows several men to inseminate her, not only within a short length of time, but also in each other's presence. Y'all let me know what y'all feel about this down below, because we need to discuss this. With all this dating stuff and all this people trying to hurry up and find and speed date, and uh, women are getting hurt and men are getting, we getting soul ties and stuff like that. That's why this is being discussed, because we weren't, we weren't educated. The church just told us, don't fornicate, don't commit adultery. Parents just told you, keep your legs closed, don't have sex, don't be kissing boys. We weren't educated right. Everybody has to admit, a lot of us were, many of us weren't, because you wouldn't have what the, the issues we have today that we're facing, all right? At the other extreme is conventional infidelity in which a woman allows two men to inseminate her over a slightly longer time span and not in each other's presence. At both extremes, what the woman is doing is essentially the same. Having selected two or more men by the criteria we discussed in scene 18 as suitable genetics fathers for her next child. So she's trying to line up the genes. That's why a lot of them have the multiple fathers uh, because that's exactly what they're pretty much doing. She calls into sperm. She calls their sperm to battle. Fighting for dominance. The, this ensures that her child will inherit not only all of the qualities she has selected, but also the genes for the production of the competitive ejaculate. Whew. As long as this latter benefit outweighs any association, associated cause such as a greater risk of disease from having sex with two men instead of one. So that's what she risks having a disease. She will gain from her behavior. So that can't be, that can't be normal then because she runs a greater risk. At, at first, it might seem that such a strategy works only if the woman conceives a son. After all, a daughter will not produce an ejaculate competitive or not. And to some extent, this is correct. The sex of the child does make some difference to the woman's gain, but not much. Because both son, sons and daughters will inherit genes to be passed on to their grandson, great-grandson, and so on for all the qualities of uh, qualities the woman has selected in the man who wins the war. Now, if you take that with the mitochondrial DNA, and y'all need to look that up, it's the the mitochondrial DNA. I don't know if he's factored that in, or he didn't know about it, or will we ever come across it in his books? But with the mitochondrial DNA, it's not passed from the son. It's only passed, only the mother can pass it to the boy and the girl. And I hear that right here. But then he said, then they pass it on. No, they don't. Because if you look it up, unless they are lying, somebody's lying and giving misinformation about the mitochondrial DNA, which we were always micro, mitrilineal. So, and I've always said, when I read the, and studied the mitochondrial DNA, the mother can have a boy and a girl, and we drew that before, right? Remember, I drew it already on the board. The mother can have a boy and a girl and pass it on, but the girl can pass it on to her boy and girl, but the son cannot. But if the son gets with a woman, has a baby, she's going to pass it on. He stops. Because now it's the woman that he's with that's going to pass it on to a boy or a girl. So every boy is kind of looks like it's stopping to a point. And so I'm wondering what, uh, what 
way is he coming from this information? All right, because I can hear a little bit of it, but then I'm like, yeah, but the mitochondria, we were saying that it didn't pass from the son to the baby. It only passes through the girl, to the boy or the girl, to the girl, to the boy or the girl she has, to the boy, to the girl, I mean, to the girl, to the boy or the girl she has, but not the, not the men, right? Because whoever the men get with, it will be that woman's line mitochondria DNA. So we're always matrilineal, if y'all can vision it, right? Can y'all see it? Or do I need to draw it? Because I know some people are visual. But I, I can see it, but I don't know if y'all can see it. But I'm trying not to get the board, okay? Because uh, y'all know I love my board. <laughs> okay, so hmm, the only bonus is from having sons is that the woman will have produced a male descendant with a competitive ejaculate in the, late, in the very next generation. See, including his genes for the competitive ejaculate. The only bonus from having a son is that the woman will have produced a male descendant with a competitive ejaculation in the very next generation. So whenever her sons have children, they're going to have that competitive ejaculation to... Have, have a child for the mother's side. That's the only, that's the only, what I'm seeing. That's the, that's the only, uh, uh, what's the word? Comparison that I'm, I'm, I get it. I get what he's saying there, but that's like, you get what I'm saying? I feel like that's what he's saying for the mother's side because that is hers and her side goes on still through her son because that's still her son. But his sperm got to now overpower anybody else that's going to try to pregnant the girl. Like what he was describing in all the other two books. All right. In pursuing this strategy, a woman encounters a major problem. The men she selects to compete with will rarely be given an equal chance to demonstrate their prowess, their prowess at sperm warfare. Because when the time interval between insemination is relatively long the outcome of that warfare is determined more by when she ovulates than by the competitiveness of the two armies Dang. see in scene six we saw that if the woman's partner had inseminated her just a few hours earlier he would have won the war but because his army would have been any more or less competitive, but simply because his sudden flood of new sperm would have reached the egg just in time. The closer together in the time a woman can procure ejaculates from different men, the better she tests their ejaculates competitiveness. But then don't know who the father is without taking DNA tests. And that seems to be what women are ashamed to do because they the society has them looking like, mm-hmm, oh, boy, this man is deep. <laughs> It says the ultimate would be if two inseminate could be mixed together in the semial pool before any sperm were allowed to leave, then the ejaculates would have exactly equal opportunity and victory would go to the more competitive. Wow. But this could happen only if a woman had two men penises in her vagina at the same time. <laughs> And both ejaculate stimulously. I mean simultaneously. Maybe this does not happen. <laughs> maybe maybe this does sometime happen, but not often enough to be discussed seriously. Dang. Interestingly, this problem of timing can be turned to a woman's advantage by adjusting the interval between insemination by different men she can bias the competition to favor either ejaculate competitiveness or the man's, the men's other qualities, especially the closer together she allows different men to inseminate her, the more weight 
she gives to the competitiveness of their ejaculates. The further, up, the further apart, the more weight she gives to their other qualities, especially if her body over time ovulation to favor the, the man whose quality she prefers. It's almost done? What? No or yeah? Yeah, it's Where's the rice? You can you got the in there. Jenny made the taco and dear God almighty. What taco? I got the itis. Just Dang. now? Just now? Boy, you could. I swear I was in Mexico. You That's swear you was in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> Girl, you crazy. Let me read. Y'all be quiet, huh? No. A taco? Yeah. Then they ain't gonna eat my beans. Then that's that can wait for tomorrow. Let's talk to us. Yeah, give me one. You got one? What you put it on it? What you put on it? God gifted hands. God gifted hands. Is ain't gonna or something. Oh yeah. She said, oh yeah. Oh yeah. We need to we need to open up a taco then. We need to open up a taco stand. Oh, y'all always on this. I almost shed a tear after I had to hold it in. Oh, Lord. Oh, oh Lord. Like, oh, Lord. I'm going to lay my fingers. Oh, Lord. I'm going to I'm gonna stop right there, y'all. Okay. No, let me read. Okay. Your, your timer went off. I heard it. Yeah, but I ain't finished. That's crazy. All right, if you make it, go ahead. Well, I can be finished. You know what? We're going to stop right there. You're right. We're going to stop. I don't want to wear y'all out, but this book is good. But y'all see that? So hold that thought. And we're going to continue this in the next day or so. Right where we left off at. As y'all can see, these three, we're reading three at the same time. Because I want to see how spirit is going to correlate these topics that we discussed in these books. So if y'all haven't, I will post the link below where y'all can get these on Amazon because they were hard to find. They had them on Kindle, but of course, Kindle don't give you the whole book. Uh, so if you guys want the whole book, get them while they're hot because this is some hot topic stuff. And this will help y'all in the field of dating. Along with my own book, I would put at the top as well where to book, you know, get it at on my website, kimarts.org, you're not it, sis. Also along with an affirmation book too as well. Uh, uh, positive affirmation books. So get my book on dating, dating advice, dating tips, uh, relationships. You're not it, sis. And men, it is for you too. So don't let the cover fool you. I named that intentional like that. Uh, you're not it, sis. You got to get the book, the ebook to see what it's about. And I should have those uh, paperbacks uh, pretty soon. I've narrowed down the company. So I should have the paperbacks pretty soon. All right, and the first hundred is going to get the autographed copy, of the first hundred books that we sell. All right, so thank y'all. Appreciate y'all. Peace, love, and harmony. Thank y'all for joining the book club. And hey, let's learn and grow. Peace.